Good afternoon. I'm Lucas Morrell, professor of politics and head of the politics department here at Washington and Lee University. Last year, the Williams School of Commerce, Economics, and Politics began a lecture series entitled Conversations in the Age of Trump. We called these events conversations in the hopes that diverse experts could help inform the conversations on our campus and local community regarding how to think and act as citizens in the aftermath of what everyone considers a most contentious presidential election. Edward Luce spoke on Trump and the crisis of Western democracy. Jonathan Rausch addressed what he called unprecedented, clever, clever, <laughs> governing in the age of chaos. This year, the series continues with today's speaker. And on November 12th, we will hear from Selena Zito, co-author of The Great Revolt, Inside the Populist Coalition, Reshaping American Politics. She's a journal who recognized that while following then-candidate Donald Trump was important, obviously, uh, even more important was following the followers, getting to know the supporters of Donald Trump. And she was one of the few journalists who saw something happening, as some people pejoratively call it, in flyover country with regards to the traction that a candidacy by Donald Trump uh, was having. A week after the 2016 presidential election, here at WNL, we held a panel. It was called The Election and Its Meanings. I joined professors from the law school, the college, and the Williams School to offer reflections on the election of Donald Trump. In my remarks, I presented a simple question. Do we, the people, intend to be a constitutional people? Republics such as ours, as my students know, require good winners and good losers. For the losers in the 2016 election, being good did not mean simply accepting the result, although that is certainly required in our Republican system. For the next two to four years, the political losers had the obligation to try to change the minds of the citizenry and become the next constitutional majority. In America, our political practice must be if at first you don't succeed. Try, try again. The upcoming midterm elections will give the first nationwide indication of whether the Trump train keeps rolling or whether other engineers will apply the brakes, direct the country in a different direction. Today's speaker, informed by his own service in the Trump administration, will give us a status report about how the Trump presidency has shaped our constitutional way of life. Michael Anton served as deputy assistant to President Trump for strategic communications on the National Security Council. He's also a former speechwriter for Rudy Giuliani and George W. Bush's National Security Council. He received his undergraduate degree from UC Davis before earning advanced degrees in political science from St. John's College and my alma mater, Claremont Graduate University. He has written editorials for the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and the Claremont Review of Books, and he is currently a lecturer in politics and a research fellow at the Kirby Center uh, for Hillsdale College in Washington, DC. Our speaker gained some notoriety a couple of months before the 2016 election with an essay entitled The Flight 93 Election. Writing other, under the pseudonym Publius Decius Muse, he argued that all of Trump's Republican competitors, quote, would have ensured more of the same, end quote, which he believed would be no better than simply voting for the Democratic alternative, Hillary Clinton. At least with Trump, despite his manifest flaws, there was a chance to make, quote, secure borders, economic nationalism, and America first foreign policy, end quote, the prime directives of a Republican administration. This provocative essay offered one conservative's assessment of what ails America and why Trump provided an alternative to a status quo that was being maintained by both major political parties. There's no telling at least I couldn't tell if his essay had any appreciable impact on the last election. But it did land him a job with the president. 
Add to this his training in political theory, having studied the American founding, along with the politics of antiquity. And our speaker, I believe, brings both a theoretical and practical background and perspective on how Trump has helped, in his mind, Americans understand what it means to live as a constitutional people. And so to commemorate Constitution Day, actually the official title, I believe, is Constitution Day and Citizenship Day, Michael Anton will walk us through the purpose of the United States Constitution, how it is designed to achieve its ends, and what Trumpism means for our American way of life. I should note that this year we commemorate the Constitution the day after the official Constitution Day, which of course was yesterday, September 17th. Uh, that was to accommodate our speaker who attended a memorial service yesterday in New York City for a Washington and Lee alum, uh, Tom Wolfe, the acclaimed novelist and social commentator. Uh, so thank you for making the trip, <laughs> a quick turnaround from New York City. Uh, so to continue our conversations in the age of Trump, please join me in welcoming Michael Anton. Just for the record, I don't think the essay did get me the job. And the only reason I say that is I was already involved with the transition before I wrote it. And after I got the job, several very senior people uh, said, uh, hey, I heard you wrote something about before. They, was that, not, not only did they not say that was you, they didn't even know what it was. They had to, it had to be explained to them. Oh, somebody wrote something in September about the election, and it turns out that was you. Hey, that's great. I don't think it had anything to do with it. But um, all right. So you, you, you took my opening in the sense that um, I was going to mention that before I get to the Constitution, um, I was going to talk about, I think, Washington and Lee's perhaps not most famous alumnus ever, but I think arguably the most famous of the 20th century, um, who died in May of this year, and who I was privileged to get to know after a sort of lifelong fanhood. I, 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 once, I was once talking to a friend of mine uh, who, you know, who, didn't know anything about my interest in Wolf, and he said something like, are, are you a Tom Wolf fan? And I said, no. And he sort of paused and thought, oh, yeah, I knew what he was thinking. He was like, well, nobody's perfect. I mean, maybe the guy doesn't have good taste. And I said, no, I'm a Tom Wolf idolater. And he said, ah, OK, that makes sense. So as years of being a Tom Wolf idolater, I got to know him starting around eight years ago. And got to interview him a number of times and hang out with him and go to his apartment and do various things with him. It was a, really a great privilege. And then I was really honored to be invited to the memorial service. And I was especially grateful that Professor Morell was able to rearrange things so that I could go to that. I didn't, I didn't want to miss it. Um, I discovered him, essentially, to those of you who are students, when I was your age. I was 19. I was a junior in college. It was, uh, if you haven't read him, I, I, already, I, I urge you to sort of you know, drop every, don't drop everything, you know, do your work, get good grades, but drop everything else and read immediately because he's fantastic. Um, he changed my life almost immediately when I read him and I devoured everything I could find. I just read all, I, I, I found one book and I just ran through the rest almost like locusts eating a cornfield. Um, and at this time, he, you know, he was still in his prime. He had a number of books left to publish and I would await those, like people would describe, I've heard it described that you know, there were certain composers in the 19th century that had these obsessive fan followings and you'd have to wait two or three years. Well, with Tom Wolfe, you had to wait 11 years between The Bonfire of the Vanities and The Man in Full. It was very painful, I can tell you that. Um, but so the, the, a couple of reasons to read him, as I say, one is he's really, really funny. He's just fun, you will enjoy it. You will have more fun than you will have reading almost any book. They're like amusement park rides. All of his books are like that. The, the fun and the hilarity masks an underlying seriousness that I think people don't notice or haven't yet noticed. There's almost a sense that, and in fact, when A Man in Full came out, this is 1998, this is his second novel, um, it was a massive blockbuster, sold a gazillion copies, and the literary establishment essentially said, several of them, it can't be that good because it's too popular, right? That's proof that it cannot be a serious work of literature. Um, but he's a, he was a serious man. He left here uh, and went to Yale and he got a PhD intending to become an academic. Um, he found that life frustrating and got out. Now I'm going to read a little quote here. I used to have, the, this is Tom Wolfe on graduate school. This gives you a sense of his writing style. I had this quote, just for the record, 
print it out. I printed it out on large paper and I didn't quite frame it, but I put some kind of border around it. And I stuck it up in my little cubicle at a think tank where I worked when I was in grad school, just to remind me of what life was. And the president of the think tank at the time, for whom Professor Morell also worked, came into my little cubicle and he saw the quote. And it's a long, you know, long quote. And he looked at it and he kind of squinted his eyes and he read the whole thing. And he looked at me and he just kind of went. <laughs> so this is Wolf talking about why he did not go into academia, but instead went into journalism. He said, I had just spent five years in graduate school, a statement that may mean nothing to people who never served such a stretch. It is the explanation nonetheless. I'm not sure I can give you the remotest idea of what graduate school is like. Nobody ever has. Millions of Americans now go to graduate schools, but just say the phrase, graduate school. And what picture leaps into the brain? No picture, not even a blur. Half the people I knew in graduate school were going to write a novel about it. I thought about it myself. No one ever wrote such a book, as far as I know. Everyone used to sniff the air. How morbid. How poisonous. Nothing else like it in the world. But the subject always defeated them. It defied literary exploitation. Such a novel would be a study of, of frustration, but a form of frustration so exquisite, so ineffable, nobody could describe it. This is the best part. Try to imagine the worst part of the worst Antonioni movie you ever saw or reading Mr. Samler's Planet at one sitting, or just reading it, or being locked inside a seaboard railroad roomette 16 miles from Gainesville, Florida, heading north on the Miami to New York run, with no water and the radiator turning red in an amuck, psychotic overboil, and George McGovern sitting beside you, telling you his philosophy of government. <laughs> that will give you the general atmosphere. Now, the references are a little dated. Um, you look up Antonioni, you can look up Mr. Samler's Planet. It's actually, I finally read it I, after having read this quote. It's not as bad as he makes it sound. I thought it was pretty good. That aside, a Saul Bellow book from 1972 or something. Um, needless to say, after that experience, he decided the academic life was not for him. So what he did is he wrote a cover, this was like 1959. He wrote a cover letter. He sent it to almost every newspaper in the country. He got one response, one response from the Springfield, uh, the, the daily paper in Springfield, Massachusetts. said, yeah, we'll, we'll talk to you. So he went to Springfield, Massachusetts, and he got, he got a job. Now, in those days, nowadays, um, journalism is very, very elite. Everybody comes from an Ivy League school or you know, an elite small college. Uh, it's very much like grad school. You don't escape grad school by going into journalism. You continue this, that sort of life by going into journalism. But in, Tom, in 1959, it was as far, if you've ever seen one of those old black and white movies about reporters, and they're all you know, half drunk all day, and you know, they're clothes are disheveled and their hats tilted on the side of their head and stubble and cigarettes everywhere. It was kind of like that in those days. So Wolf thought, yeah, this is great. Um, but he, he took his academic training with him. And I would say for the first four or five years of his career, he would say this too. He was just churning out ordinary daily copy. He worked in Springfield and then he went to, briefly to the Washington Post before it became a national powerhouse like it, it was after Watergate. And then he ended up at the New York Herald Tribune, which went under in the 60s. But back then was a, a, one of the major newspapers in the United States. It was sort of the Republican, the liberal Republican newspaper of record launched Dwight Eisenhower's political career, among other things. It was the kingpin competitor to the New York Times. Um, and that's when the real wolf started to come out. Um, and, and I, there, you know, when people think of Tom Wolfe and what makes his writing unique, they think of the style. If you've ever read his books, you know that the style is, is very unique. I just read you a passage, you know, these crazy run-on sentences exclamation points everywhere, bizarre punctuation. I mean, he, have, he invents punctuation marks or the usage of semicolons and colons and things that you've never seen before. Um, he will describe sounds and words in, in ways that you, you know, or try to mimic accents. He does all this stuff. That's what people think. But th there's another key feature is that his, his PhD was in American studies, right, which is interdisciplinary. So it required him to learn literature, art and art history, architecture, philosophy, psychology, history, and then on his own, he took up the study of the, uh, natural science, in particular brain science and neuroscience, which he sort of learned later in his life, but became an obsession of his. So there's this massive amount of very serious scholarly learning underneath all of this work that the fun whiz-bang roller coaster surface um, tends to obscure. Uh, and, I, and I have spent a lot of time reading him, obviously, and studying him, and I've written a couple of pseudo-scholarly, quasi-scholarly articles about him, and that's what I try to do. And there's, I think, a ton more to be done 
uh, studying him carefully and, you know, and teasing out the way we read a text carefully. You know, everybody knows if you're assigned Plato or Aristotle or something like that, we've well, got to read it really carefully because there's all these hidden meanings. But you sort of know going in that there's hidden meanings. If somebody gives you a popular novel published in the last 30 years, you just assume, yeah, there's nothing. I mean, it's just, you know, it's a thriller or whatever it is. It's just a popular book. There's nothing serious under there. But in Tom Wolfe's case, there is. Um, I was trained in political philosophy, like Professor Morell, and I would not call Tom Wolfe a philosopher, but I would call him a philosophic literary man, i.e. more than a writer, more even than a no novelist. He intends to be a conveyor of truth. Now, he was always very humble about this. He always just said, I'm, a, I'm just a reporter. I just go out, I look at stuff, and I report what I see, which is um, it's, 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 it's a wonderful way to put it because it's, it's, it's kind of humble without being humble, right? He's, he's right. He was an observer. He was just reporting what he saw. He did not have to add, because his work spoke for itself, that he was really the best observer at his time, not merely the most accurate, although he was that, but like the philosopher, he was looking at the most important things. It's one thing to go out and see a bunch of stuff that's all accurate, but that doesn't matter. But he was looking at and looking for the most important things. So in this way, in that little answer, because he was, he was a very, um, you know, we were talking earlier today at a lunch about the manners of students, and Professor Morell said that the manners of the Washington, he's very impressed by the manners of Washington and Lee students, that they're very, um, all of the students, you know, behave themselves in a, in a dignified in, in, in way, which, you know, I, I, the places where I went to school, I'm not sure one could say that uh, with such confidence. But Wolf was very much, you know, a, a, an old school southern gentleman type. Um, and it, it brings to that, so in that, in that way, he told the truth about himself without boasting, but also without false humility. And it reminds me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to geek you up here with two Greek phrases before I move on. The first is megalopsychia, okay? That is the phrase Aristotle uses in the Nicomachean Ethics for the peak of the virtues, of the 11 moral virtues, and it literally means greatness of soul, often translated as magnanimity because of uh, a, a Latin tradition. Aristotle says that is the virtue of being worthy of great honors, knowing that one is worthy of great honors and behaving appropriately in that worthiness. In other words, no boasting, no false humility. Wolf had that. Um, I remember talking to him once in somehow the subject of some, and I know who it was, but I'm not going to say who it was, of some other very eminent figure came up and the guy's kind of a jerk. And we had both had run-ins with this person and I said to Mr. Wolf, I was called him Mr. Wolf whenever I talked to him, said, you know, uh, yes, I've experienced that with this particular person, and you know, you're, you're not like that. You're, you're at least as eminent, if not more so, than he is, and you, I've never seen you act like that, not to me, not to anybody else. And he, he just sort of sighed and said, it's my southern upbringing. <laughs> and the other, the other phrase I'm going to use is um, in Greek, auto kat hoto, which literally means itself by itself. I'll explain what I mean by that. So if you've ever seen an Alfred Hitchcock movie, in every Alfred Hitchcock movie, Alfred Hitchcock is in, he puts himself in the movie for a split second. He's walking down the street, he's sitting on a bus or whatever, he's always in his movies. Wolf used to do this in his books or in his essays. Uh, and obtrusively, he'd be in the story somehow. So for instance, in a story that he wrote about a record producer named Phil Spector, who later killed a woman in his house in Los Angeles County, California, and is currently in jail, but we can leave that out. We'll leave that up to one side. Wolf describes himself as a fellow with his legs crossed and a huge chocolate brown borsalino hat over his bent knee like he was just trying it on. So that, that's him. And then in a story that he's writing, a, a profile that he wrote of Natalie Wood, who's a famous actress who drowned up Catalina Island, and her husband is still being investigated for this, but that's an interesting story in and of itself. He describes himself, Natalie Wood is standing in an elevator at the St. Regis with some magazine writer in a great striped green suit. That's him. Right? So he's always, he likes to just stick himself into the story. He did it once, though, in an, in an, in an unusual way. In The Bonfire of the Vanities, he describes a character, a, a, a rude little paparazzi, you know, one of those annoying photographers named Silverstein. And he, Silverstein is one of these sort of very aggressive, obnoxious, in-your-face types who wants to get the shot. And he gets, Wolf gives a detailed physical description, and there's no possible way that you would think of Tom Wolf when you, you know, the dandy in the white suit, when you, when you read this physical description. But then he has the photographer's publisher describe him. He's, he calls him one of the farmers of journalism. They love the good, rich soil itself for itself. They love to plunge their hands into the dirt. I believe that is Wolf's description of himself. He loved, he always said he just, he didn't almost care what he found when he went out to report. 
He just wanted it to be true. He wanted, he wanted to find the truth. He loved the, the, the earth, the truth itself, for itself. That's, that's his own description of his soul, or what motivated him, I believe. Now, I, I want to add that he was not ascetic, to say the least. Uh, he lived the high life. And like Mark Twain, he, he made a lot of money. He spent a lot of money. Um, and he lived pretty big time. He wasn't, he wasn't a struggling writer up in the garret. He lived in a pretty grand Upper East Side apartment and you know, had all the suits and he had a white Cadillac with white rims and all this kind of stuff and a place in Southampton and all of that. But ultimately all of that earthly success is I don't think what motivated him. So getting back to the Greek, um, Xenophon, Xenophon is an ancient Greek author who personally knew Socrates, one of only three, and wrote about Socrates. And he writes these weird cryptic little metaphors and he's once describing a bunch of, basically he's right, a bunch of guys sitting around eating sandwiches. <laughs> and one of them doesn't want the bread. He eats the meat itself by itself. Auto cat auto. Um, that is, I won't go into the tortured interpretation that you need to go into to arrive at this conclusion. That is Xenophon's description of Plato's theory of the forms, the ideas or the edos, itself by itself. So Tom Wolfe makes that almost word for word, itself for itself in the description of Silverstein. Now, is that a coincidence? Maybe. I will just mention the following, though. I think that there are so many ways that I've seen Tom Wolfe both reveal and hide his knowledge at the same time in his books. He leaves a hint, but he doesn't rub your nose at it. He doesn't show off. He's not trying to be pedantic. He's not saying, look at me, I'm really well educated, and I can throw all these dazzling quotes and things at you. Just a tiniest little breadcrumb trail for you to find. Um, I think that's an instance of him, of him doing so. Uh, at least I would like to believe that it is. And my final thought before turning to the Constitution, I'm, I'm, I'm serious about this, although I'm, it might be taken as a joke. Washington and Lee, I think, really ought to establish a chair or something in Tom Wolfe's studies. I mean, it's a full time. It's a full time gig. There's enough there. This body of work is enormous. There's so many themes that you could dig out. It's an, it's an, you know, it's an archaeological site to be excavated for, for centuries. And not very much of it has been done. And, and just to make this easier on you, if you need a candidate, to have somebody to fill the chair. I do have a job at the moment, but I don't have tenure, so I might be poachable. Just saying. All right. Now, I did not know until recently that federal law mandates Constitution Day celebration. Um, Hillsdale College, where I teach, is not required to follow that law because Hillsdale famously does not take any federal money. But we honor Constitution Day anyway because the Constitution is... Uh, I mean, something the college cherishes, and so much of its teaching programs are designed to facilitate. So I thought about that for a second. I thought, you know, you guys might be federally required to honor Constitution Day, but like, I don't have to. My college doesn't take federal money. I can come up here and talk about anything I want to. So I decided I'm going to talk about something else entirely. Well, no. Then I thought, well, that's probably false, a false flag, a false advertising. I shouldn't do that. So I'm going to sort of talk about the Constitution, but rather than dwell on the Constitution itself, uh, I want to look underneath it and behind it. Uh, I want to talk about what it's for. Now, I will say as an aside, which is not written down here, but one of the benefits of being, as I am, so far out of the mainstream, is this argument which I'm about to make, which seems completely old hat to me, boring, like drilled into me for, for 25 years, uh, and I'm sure Professor Morell, he got it drilled into him. Uh, it, it'll bore him to tears. But it's still uh, so kind of weird that it'll sound new to you, right? Uh, and that, that, that's, uh, uh, that's a benefit to being a bit, a bit out of it in my case, because I can, I can say something that's old hat to me and it sounds new. All right, so to make things easier on us, when we're discussing what the Constitution is for, we do have the happy fact that the document itself tells us what it's for. It's right there in the preamble. It is to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. All right, it tells us what it's for. So the first point I want to get across, and this is important, I spent a lot of time fighting with my fellow conservatives, partly because I just enjoy it, partly because they have it coming. Um, the Constitution is not a positivist document. This is a the conservative argument that's been bouncing around for years, that the Constitution is a positivist document. Well, what, that's a fancy word, positivist. What does it mean? I do not mean by positivist, really, really certain. I'm positive. That's not what I mean, right? No, positivist is derived from a verb, to posit, which means to assert, to assume as a fact, or put forward as the basis of an argument, to put forth or put in position. 
So this is the way a lot of people, especially certain conservative legal scholars, treat the Constitution. They treat it as if it were the rules printed on the inside of a box top to a board game, right? We have to follow them, or it's better if we do, but at root they're just made up. So, I mean, the, the rules to any game, think about chess, right? The, queen can go, the king and the queen can both go in any direction, but the queen can go an unlimited number of spaces and the king can only go one space. That's a posited rule. There's nothing in nature that says that. The rules are made up, okay? Monopoly, same thing. Now, I'm not dismissing this argument out of hand with respect to the Constitution. There is truth in it, in that the Constitution was in fact written by human beings. In that sense, it is positivist. It had to be posited. But in intent, it is not fundamentally positivist. It has a purpose. And its purpose is linked to nature. Okay, what do I mean by that? All right, the American Revolution, like all revolutions, is a particular event. It happened in this country owing to the actions of a particular people. Yet unlike all prior revolutions, the American people asserted a universalist claim, not merely, you know, Brexit, we don't like you, we're leaving, although they did say that. There were some good memes going around after Brexit with George Washington wearing sunglasses, like I did it first, I was cool, you know. Um, but they also said we hold these truths to be self-evident and all men are created equal and inalienable rights from nature and nature's God. Now, as Lincoln pointed out much later, they didn't have to do that. He called the Declaration of Independence, and he seemed to damn it initially as faint praise, a merely revolutionary document, merely revolutionary. In other words, if you're just saying, we're leaving, we're breaking up, you know, it's not you, it's me, whatever, however you're going to justify it, you don't need to make any universalist claims uh, uh, to nature, rights, any of these things. You just don't need to do that. So why did they do it? Says Lincoln. Uh, to set up a standard maxim for a free society. Uh, state the ground of political legitimacy forever. To be a bulwark against tyranny forever. Um, I will read another, but shorter, but also not as funny, quote. This is from Federalist Number 1. Uh, the opening sentences of Federalist Number 1. It has been frequently remarked that it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country by their conduct and example to decide the important question whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. So essentially what they're saying is England, France, any other country that you can think of came to be as a part of accident and force. And in fact, you could dig down a little deeper and say, we don't really even know how England, France, China, or Japan came to be. There's no July 4th, 1776 for any of these countries where they get together and say, we are breaking off, we are forming a people separate from this people and also these other peoples and establishing ourselves. It doesn't happen that way. You can study the histories of many of these countries and you could get a broad sketched outline of how they came together, but it will only be that. Um, it'll be your, your best guess based on the available record and always be subject to debate. Um, and certainly it won't have occurred on the basis of direct deliberation the way the American founders deliberated and decided the Declaration of Independence and um, 11 years, yeah, 11 years later, the Constitution. So in other words, here they are claiming true, the, the, the founders, American founders assert true claims of goodness, rightness, and justice. Um, but then they have questions. Can you actually found a government on those bases? You might know what the truth is, what, what the true political principles are, but conclude something like, well, that's great in the abstract. This is sort of what a lot of ancient political philosophy says. Yeah, we can figure out what the true political principles are, but you can't found a regime based on them. That's just humanly impossible. So you have to rely on accident and force with some corrective mitigation from po political philosophy. Um, or perhaps they're, they're simply abstract notions that can't be put into practice at all. Or perhaps they're abstract notions that can inform practice, but that are impractical as actual foundations. So the American founders with that point in Federalist I are saying essentially, no one has ever done this before, but we're going to try it. And they have to, they, I, as an aside, I will say they have to make a defense of it. They have, to, they have to spend the first essentially 16 papers in the Federalist telling the American people, this is worth trying. because. To the people of the world at that time, every society they know is a monarchy of some form or another. Republics have all failed. Um, and to the extent that republics have not failed, they've been really small. 
So they've got this twofold problem. They've got to, they have to justify republicanism. They have to justify, uh, 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 threefold really, they have to justify republicanism. They have to justify republicanism in a very large territory. And uh, they have to justify this deliberative process that they're going to undertake to build a written constitution because no country has a written constitution at that time. The most famous constitution in the world is the English constitution, which is very famously and I would say jealously in the sense that the English are proud of the fact that the English constitution is unwritten. They view that as a virtue and they view a written constitution as, if not a vice, impractical. Okay, so when they say no one's ever done this before, but we're going to try it anyway, this is essentially what the phrase American experiment means. I mean, this is a cliche, you hear it everywhere, the American experiment. What is the American experiment? It's the response to Federalist I, whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. And it had been reserved to the people of this country to decide that question. Now, if the American experiment was indeed an experiment, we would have to call it successful. Uh, it's the longest continually operating written constitution, not just operating today, but ever in the history of the world. Um, and it has provided massive success to the American nation in peace and war, uh, prosperity and innovation, liberty for the people, safety and security, the protection of individual rights, and so on. Uh, I quote a great philosopher who said that the nation dedicated to this proposition, by the, and that phrase, dedicated to this proposition, is a clear, although not acknowledged in the text, to the Gettysburg Address, um, has now become, no doubt, partly as a consequence of this dedication, the most powerful and prosperous of the nations of the earth. In other words, according to this view, which I agree with, by the way, America's greatness, to, to coin a term one might find on a red hat, is not an accident nor a coincidence. It is directly connected to the principles of the founding. Okay. Now, I doubt this would be true if the Constitution were simply a positivist document, if it were just a rule book unmoored to anything deeper or higher than itself. I'm actually, I say I doubt this would be true. I'm sure it wouldn't be. So think about the box top analogy again. You can make up the rules for any game, no matter how silly, and if the rules are internally consistent, the game works. Um, that is to say, the rules of the game don't have to have any direct relevance to real life. So I'll use an example, Monopoly. I don't know if anybody plays it anymore. I think it came out originally in the 1920s, but it was even popular when I was young, which was not the 1920s. Uh, so maybe it's still around today. So translate Monopoly to real life. How do you get destroyed, ruined in Monopoly? You get forced to spend all your money on somebody else's hotel where you don't even want to stay. Now, if the hotel business operated like that in real life, the market would crash and would go under and there wouldn't be any hotels. Or there would be angry mobs burning down hotels and hoteliers would all be in jail, right? It's crazy. It doesn't work at all. It doesn't make any sense in terms of real life. The rules of Monopoly have no connection to real life or to nature. It's just a fun game, okay? So that's not going to work for a constitution, for the framework for human government. They have to bear some connection to real life. And that's what I mean when I say the constitution, or to, to nature when I say the Constitution is not positivist. It's not merely rules, and it's not simply made up. It is made, as it were, in a twofold image. Uh, that is to say, it has to match the matter, the particular matter, the American people, right? Madison and others, they, they re remark on this all the time. They say, we may think this is the best Constitution for us, but they're not convinced at all that it would work just anywhere. In fact, they're quite convinced that it wouldn't necessarily work just anywhere. It was tailored to fit the circumstances of the American people, the American territory, and so on. Um, for a particular country, territory, interests, traditions, and habits. But beyond being tailored to fit the particular, it is also designed to accord with nature, at least as closely as possible. It's designed to serve natural ends, which I would divide into two, the protection of mere life, which is to say physical threats pro and property and things, and the protection of the good life. You can't have the good life without mere life. You cannot live the good life if you're dead, by definition. So all of the higher things that um, an Aristotle or an ancient political philosopher or a Montesquieu or any of the modern philosophers that uh, Jefferson and Hamilton and, all, and, the, and, the, and the founders admired, all of those higher things are um, made possible or enabled by the Constitution's protection of mere life and its promotion of the good life. All right, now I'm going to give a few more specific examples of how the Constitution links up with this uh, natural idea. And really how, this is more also how it links up with the Declaration of Independence, okay? The Constitution, I would say, has three fundamental features. I don't think this is going to be horribly controversial. First is representative government. The second is limited government. And the third is the separation of powers. 
Um, none of these are incidental or positive. They're all there for a reason. They're all there for reasons that I would say are grounded in the founder's vision of, of human nature and what good government is. Okay? Uh, they are essential to fulfilling the Declaration of Independence promise. So I didn't, I'm not going to go into a great amount of detail in the Declaration of Independence. I'll just state sort of my conclusion here is that the Constitution is not meant to be seen as separate from or uh, in opposition to. It's a fulfillment. It's meant to be a fulfillment of the principles of the Declaration of Independence. And also, um, in a way, the, if the Declaration is the soul, the Constitution is the body. Or if the Declaration is the wine, the Constitution is the bottle. Or Lincoln said, uh, he said the Declaration is the apple of gold and the Constitution is the frame of silver. So, representative government. How do these two line up? Well, I'll give you an example. There are 17, you know how the Declaration goes, some few paragraphs of opening high-flown theory. 17 charges against the king, and then a few more uh, uh, rhetorical paragraphs at the end. So 17 charges against the king all, uh, to justify why the American nation is breaking off, to justify why you know, we're leaving. Um, and you know, and in, in they're, they're, I said earlier, it's not you, it's me. They're saying, oh, it's if you guys remember Seinfeld at all, oh, it's you. Right? They're saying to King George, it's you. Right? So four are about representative government. They say he's hostile, the, the, hostile to representative government. He will not allow representative government uh, in, in the American context. And they call representative government inestimable to the people, formidable to tyrants only. So this is a not negotiable for them, for the American founders. Okay? So the Constitution establishes that in keeping. And in fact, Madison in Federal 63 praises the Constitution for being the first all representative government in history. He says there's no element of our government that is not at some level directly or indirectly connected to representation. And representation is good because it restrains both rulers and ruled. And in fact, it even blurs the distinction between the rulers and the ruled. So in one sense, the rulers are the office holders, but the office holders are not the sovereign. The ruled are the people, but the people are the sovereign. So in another sense, the people are the true rulers. The office holders have to be accountable to the people. The people always retain their sovereignty, but they only act on the government periodically through elections. In other words, representative government takes away. Remember I said the early chapters of the Federalist are all a big defense. Why are we building a republic when republics are, have a really lousy track record in history? They fail all the time. Um, they say, well, one of the reasons they fail is uh, the direct participation in the people of government. So you get, you know, they give a, a great example from Thucydides, which is a pretty good example because it's really stupid, about how the Athenian assembly votes one day, send an army to go kill, these, kill off all these people. And then they sleep it off, and they get up the next day, and they go, oh, man, that's a terrible idea. Send another army to go get that army back, and we're not going to kill all those people, but we're going to punish the general, even though we're the ones who told him to go. So Eusebius sort of says, this is, you know, this is wacky. Um, all right, limited government. Um, again, in these complaints in the Declaration of Independence, they accuse the king of doing all these things that he has no right to do. He has no, by nature, he has no right to do. He shouldn't be quartering troops or all these things that government should not have the power to do, that only a tyrannical government has the power to do. So how does the Constitution solve that problem? Well, in one way, is through enumerated powers. Enumerated powers, you know, allow, they say you can do this, but you cannot do that. And it gets more specific. Um, they enumerate powers even by branch. So it's not just the government can do X, but it can't do Y. This branch can maybe do A and B, but not C or D, but that branch can do C and D, but not E and F and so on, right? So they, enumerated powers exist on more than one level. More fundamentally, limited government um, identifies a private sphere that the government just has no business being involved in at all, right? And the government has things that it's supposed to do, but it's only supposed to do those things, and the rest of your life is supposed to be left to yourself. I mean, this is most commonly expressed by Jefferson's famous phrase, uh, the government that governs least governs best. In other words, you want government to do what's necessary, but no more than that, and the private sphere should be respected. And the last feature is the separation of powers. Madison says a number of times, this was a, something that I don't, I think you know, the, the great philosopher of the separation of powers was uh, the French philosopher Montesquieu, the, who the founders read intently, and Madison calls him the celebrated Montesquieu. Uh, at a couple of points. They say that the def almost the definition of tyranny is to hold, so there are three fundamental powers of government, executive, legislative, and judiciary. Almost a definition of tyranny is to have one pair of hands hold all three powers. So I get to write the law. I get to execute the law. I get to accuse you, accuse you of being in violation of the law, try you and judge you and sentence you. I get to do all of that myself. There's nobody else who can step in and go, wait a minute. You're interpreting the law unfairly, or I think he didn't do it, or something. You know, you hold up. They're saying the king was doing that, and that's 
that's fundamentally against nature, and we're not going to do that in our, um, in our government. They also make an argument in favor of the separation of powers that it allows for a sort of division of labor and specialization that um, makes the individual branches of government more effective. All right, so a couple of, th those are, the, uh, that was meant to be that little digression in a sense like all digressions, it's actually the heart of the argument, it was meant to be a defense of the Constitution as not positivist, as a document rooted in, in some conception of nature, but, all, but the, specifically the conception of nature that's outlined in the Declaration of Independence, that the two documents are like binary stars. You really can't have one without the other. The Deplor Declaration establishes the people, but it doesn't establish the government. The Constitution doesn't establish the people, and if it's only the rule, the box top rules, uh, it doesn't tell you anything about what the government's supposed to do. It's just going to tell you how the machine operates. It doesn't tell you what the machine's for. It makes no moral claims, in other words. Now, a couple times a decade, all this comes to the fore when we have to confirm a Supreme Court justice. I actually wrote that sentence before the latest business uh, with Kavanaugh, where it seems like I'm in a time machine and it's 1991 again, but I'm going to leave that out and just get back to the, what, what this usual debate that ensues when we're not doing what we're doing now is um, it's a debate about one side says, we want original intent. We're just going to read what's there. We're going to stick to what's there. And another side says, well, living constitution. We got to have a living constitution because constitution's old. Uh, it's written for another time. It's outdated. It makes compromises with bad things. There are three specific, the word slavery is never mentioned in the constitution, of course, but there are three points in which the constitution makes a compromise with slavery. So they say the document is sort of morally uh, compromised, we can't, we can't live by original intent anymore. Needless to say, I take the latter side. I'm, I'm, I'm for the original intent uh, and not the, uh, the, the living constitution. Um, I will say right now that part of the reason I'm an original intent guy is because all three of the specific mentions of slavery in the original constitution were corrected by subsequent constitutional amendments, in other words, by constitutional means. So if you read a copy of the constitution, those will either be in strike through or in italics because they don't operate anymore. Okay. So I think original intent is by itself inadequate. It is necessary, for, but insufficient. It's not enough to know what the Constitution says. It, it, we need to know what it's intended to do. Um, I'm gonna read perhaps the most, at least to me, this is the most famous Supreme Court sentence from my lifetime. This is from uh, 1992. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and the mystery of human life. Now, that sounds, I was going to say that sounds great. I, I can't say it. It doesn't sound great to me. It sounds loopy to me, right? I don't get to define entirely my own. I, there's a, I have a certain latitude and freedom, but I don't get to completely define my own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and the mystery of human life. There's a hard nature out there that defines some of this for us, right? There are certain moral imperatives, rights, wrongs, justices, and injustices that we don't get to define away. So you, in other words, you can't you, you, you cannot consistently condemn this, the Constitution's compromises with slavery and then say that sentence. You, you gotta pick one, right? So I'm gonna stick with condemning the compromises with slavery and discarding the sentence and saying that there's moral truth out there that we can learn. Okay, so no one who truly understands what the Constitution is for could have written that. Another, a great example, I'm sure anyone who's taken Professor Morell's class will know this example by heart. It's um, the Dred Scott decision. Um, Arguably, I think, yeah. Do we need to use the word arguably or can we drop it? In any event, if it's not the worst Supreme Court decision of all time, it's top two, maybe top three. Um, so it is a deliberate, Dred Scott is based on a deliberate misreading of the Constitution. The, justice, chief, the chief justice who wrote it came to it with a vision of what he wanted to do. He knew full well what the Declaration of Independence said and meant. He knew that what the Declaration of Independence said, meant, and was intended to do got in the way of what he wanted to do with the Dred Scott decision. So he just reads the Declaration out. He just says uh, the moral purpose of the Constitution is irrelevant here. This is how textual literalism can lead one astray. He basically concludes from the compromises, this is 1857, so this is before the Civil War, this is before the post-Civil War amendments that corrected uh, uh, the, the stuff that I was talking about. Um, he, so he's, he reads those compromises and says, I can kind of do what I want. And you end up um, with this notoriously terrible decision that helped precipitate the Civil War. Now, a proper understanding, coming to the document with an idea of what it's for, um, makes, would, would make that much more difficult. So, uh, I, okay. now, 
Proper originalism, then, is not simply conservative positivism. 99% of the time, a proper jurisprudence will get to the same place. This is important because um, the, the great teacher that I had and that Professor Morell had is a man named Harry Jaffa. Harry Jaffa spent a lot of time fighting his friends, so it would seem, right? So he was a conservative, and yet he was always going after Robert Bork and Antonin Scalia and William Rehnquist and these other sort of heroes of the conservative legal movement. And people would say, why are you, I used to say to him, why are you doing this, Professor Jaffa? You're, you're really beating the heck out of these guys, and they're on your side. He said, yeah, yeah, I like the way they vote in the court, but they're not really on my side because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what the Constitution is for. They have this positivist vision. Um, and it's going to, you know, it, it, that will have long-term negative consequences for constitutional interpretation. It reminds me of um, another remark that um, a great philosopher made about Thomas Hobbes. And Thomas Hobbes, is, um, Thomas Hobbes famously proclaims himself to be the, the true founder of political philosophy. And this is in the 17th century, in the 1600s. He says, all political philosophy that came before me was not political philosophy. It was false. It was wrong. It was phony. It was all built on air. And his core reason was political philosophy and holding up this standard of natural justice allows an appeal from the positive law to a higher law. Anytime you allow an appeal from the positive law to the higher law, you are an anarchist. You're essentially opening the door for people to read anything they want into anything. And that's what the conservative positives say about the Constitution, that if you allow an appeal beyond the text, you're, uh, you're, opening your, you're an anarchist, or you're opening up yourself you know, to the living Constitution doctrine. You have no um, sound defense against the living Constitution doctrine. Um, whereas I sympathize a little. Um, I just think that when you don't, when you're f the fundamental thought in your mind is, is, is not what is this for? What is it trying to do? What vision of justice is it trying to serve? Um, you're, I think, much more likely to go astray than if you do begin from there. That should be the discussion. If I were a senator, which I never will be, um, uh, that's the only question I would ask. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be needling these people about other stuff. I would just, every nomination, I'd be asking this question. How do you want to interpret the con Constitution? What do you think it's for? What do you think is behind it and underneath it? And if I got the answer I wanted, which I never would, then I'd vote to confirm that person. And if I didn't get the answer I wanted, I would vote no, uh, no matter who it was, even if it was uh, somebody I probably should vote for otherwise, politically. That should be the discussion we have about the Constitution. Uh, I think every year until Jaffa's vision wins and, and, and people see it that way. But I think it's unquestionably the right way. I'll end there. Thank you. You've been patient with him, and now he'll be patient with you. <laughs> if you have questions. Uh, this is the time for it, and I'd like to call first on a student, if a student has a question for our speaker. The state of Virginia has an amendment in their constitution that requires the legislator to pass a balanced budget each, each year. Do you think that would be something worthwhile in the national constitution? Um, I think it would be, wor n n short answer is no, because I think that there are, at the national level, circumstances in which debt is justified and even necessary. And you know, I'm not, I'm not one of the world's great experts on this question of a balanced budget amendment, but I've read a lot of the scholarship on it and the for and against arguments. And I've more, been more convinced by the against arguments that it, it, you know, the, the fundamental spending problems that you have you know, are maybe not necessarily going to be solved by a balanced budget. And you, let me put it this way. Let's say you pass the balanced budget amendment. You haven't fixed the underlying problem, which is that politicians just want to spend a lot of money, right? So you've sort of tried to tie their hands with what Madison would call a parchment barrier without fixing their understanding, without persuading them that balancing the budget in times of peace and fiscal responsibility is better. So I'm not sure, A, that that solves the problem. In fact, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't. And then you have the problem of what do you do in wartime or what do you do in certain circumstances when debt is justified, necessary, and maybe good. Uh, one of your more contentious issues is on uh, immigration and particularly, I don't know if I drew up the Washington Post not long ago. Um, <coughs> and I guess my question is, how do you kind of view immigration uh, and roles in the government? So people like Ted Cruz or um, Elaine Chao, 
and how they kind of are immigrants yet. Uh, well, I don't think either one of them is actually an immigrant. Um, I mean, born here. So, uh, not necessarily with Ted Cruz born in Canada uh, to a non American father and yes, an American. But as, but as an American citizen mother, then, but leave the individual status of Ted Cruz aside. Um, look, I've, I've written a lot about this, not just the op ed, but as I said to, earlier today, the op ed's 800 words. Um, I've subsequently written another 15,000 words uh, going into this. It kind of all says the same thing, so it might be boring to read over and over again. But look, I, my point in that op-ed was the 14th Amendment is being misread as requiring birthright citizenship for anybody who happens to reside on American soil, when, which was not the original intent. It's not what the, the, the framers of the 14th Amendment intended to do. What they intended to do was settle the forever this, the citizenship question of her freed slaves. So this gets a little in the weeds, but I'll, I'll give the shortest answer I can. I mentioned the Dred Scott decision already. One of the things the Dred Scott decision held was that no black person could ever be a citizen of the United States, including free, free black people then resident in northern states who had never been slaves. All of a sudden, the Supreme Court just swoops in and says, you're not a citizen, and you can't be, right? Lincoln's outraged by this, and a lot of people are outraged by this. The war happens, 13th Amendment passed, that question is still open because citizenship had never been defined federally. And so there were states that were saying at the time, 1865, 1866, okay, 13th Amendment says we can't have slaves anymore, we'll, we'll, we'll abide by that, um, but we, citizenship rests at the state level and we're not gonna confer citizenship. So the, the, legislate, the Reconstruction legislators said, well, that's completely unacceptable. We're going to fix that. And they fix it first by passing the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And then the question comes up, well, that's just a statute law. This should be in the, if, if we're going to define citizenship, this needs to be in the Constitution. So they draft the 14th Amendment. But then, and, and one of the ways they're going to clarify, well, how do we define who's this? And let's tell people born here, right? Every freed slave was born in the territory of the United States. That, that's an inescapable logic. If we define it that way, then there's no way for any state to get around and try to withhold citizenship. But then others raise their hand and say, well, that means anybody born here. And they go back and forth. You can read the debate in the old, it was then called the Congressional Globe. It's essentially a precursor to the Congressional Record. And they say, okay, no, it's not anybody born here. You have to be subject to the jurisdiction, meaning um, not owing allegiance to a foreign power. So you can't be the children of citizens of foreigners. This still, of course, would have included every freed slave, none of whom owed allegiance to any foreign power, and who were the children of people also born in the United States who are going to be granted citizenship. So that clause has been either read out of the 14th Amendment or interpreted just to mean subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Well, it just means you're subject to US law. But everybody who comes to the US except foreign diplomats are subject to US law. If you come down from Canada as a tourist, you're subject to US law in two fundamental ways. You have to obey it, right? You can't say, well, I'm not a citizen, so I can, I can you know, go break into your car. But you're also entitled to its protection. So if somebody assaults you and you're not a citizen, you could say, I appeal to uh, protection from the laws of the United States. And the law does not say, you're not a citizen, sorry, they can, they can you know, mug you with impunity. Um, so if that, cl if that clause is only interpreted to mean subject to the law, it doesn't need to be there. It's superfluous. But beyond that, you, all you have to do is read the debate, and they tell you what the phrase means. It's pretty clear. Then, and, you, and then you read the other debate on the um, Civil Rights Act of 1866, and it's pretty clear. And then you know, there's another, they pass a law called the, uh, the Emigration Act, Emigration with an E, uh, of 1868, which is meant to um, clarify the meaning of citizenship and consent. So Declaration of Independence says that uh, a core component of citizenship is, is government by consent. I mean, a, core, a core component of legitimacy is government by consent. Um, found, so, but you initially consent to the social compact when you're in the social compact. So if you're in the country on 1776, either you, you or one of your representatives at the Continental Congress signs a document, you're in the social compact. How do you withdraw your consent? You leave. You become a loyalist and you go to Canada. So the Emigration Act was later meant to say there's no perpetual allegiance. There's no jus soli, which is one of the things that you know, critics have been alleging. Um, the, the citizenship of the United States from the moment of the Declaration of Independence on is based on consent. And the way, if you don't want to be a citizen upon reaching you know, age 18, that you withdraw your consent is you emigrate. And, and that codifies, and it's, the law has actually been updated a few times. I think the last time was in 54. But it is considered a, a sovereign right of the American people is we don't, unlike other countries, you know, that try to prevent people from leaving or make it unlawful to leave or say that you owe perpetual allegiance 
to the government or country of your birth, the United States is very explicit in saying that no. If you want to leave because you don't want to be here and you can find a country who wants you, that's important. We're not guaranteeing you a spot somewhere else. You've got to do that on your own. But we will, we have, the government of the United States has no right to prevent you from leaving. That's a fundamental human right. Elizabeth. Um, so in the long of discussion of immigration, do you believe that uh, children of immigrants, even if the immigrants have like become US citizens, do the children of immigrants also have to like be naturalized? No, if you're a children of someone who is a legal permanent resident, then you're uh, entitled well, there's a Supreme Court decision which holds that children of a legal permanent residence are entitled to birthright citizenship. Um, I think that Supreme Court decision to get into the weeds was wrongly decided on this just solely versus consent point. However, uh, other scholars that I uh, make an argument that I find persuasive that the 14th Amendment probably would or should include the children of legal permanent residents, whether or not the court in Wong Kim Ark got the um, perpetual allegiance, you know, the, the British common law justification right or wrong, although I think I got it wrong. So I, I don't, I don't I have to think that answered your question, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so I think that one thing that's happened over the past 50 years or so is a huge expansion in federal power, yeah. especially with bureaucracies and the executive branch. Do you believe that expansion of power was constitutional? No. And if not, what step? It's, I would say it's more than 50 years. It really goes back 100, 125 years. You start seeing the argument explicitly made for it in the late 19th century among the capital P progressives, meaning of both parties, the progressives. First there were progressive Democrats, progressive Republicans, and then there were just the progressive progressives. They formed a party. They actually won political office, took over the state of California in 1910, the first you know, statewide project that they had. Teddy Roosevelt, famously a progressive Republican, uh, retired, um, went off. To, on a long safari, got back, had, had, what, and what, saw his chosen successor, William Howard Taft, governing in ways that he didn't like, and ran against him as what he's called the Bull Moose Party. But the Bull Moose Party was essentially a, an intended to be a national progressive party. So that progressive argument was, from the beginning, an argument for um, kind of what you call expert rule. Um, this Take the executive branch and use its infrastructure or its foundation, build something that kind of looks like the executive branch, but that isn't, that's really not accountable to it, that's something else. That's where that, I think that huge expansion of federal power comes from, and uh, I, I would not call it, in fact, not only would I not call it constitutional, the progressives wouldn't. I mean, they make an explicit argument at the time, and they say, the world's gotten a lot more complicated. It's not 1787 anymore. Um, advances in technology and so forth, but also just advances in our understanding of the science of management and things like that makes these old parchment rules unusable. The Constitution's in the way. What we need are more unmediated power centers within the government that can just do stuff based on expertise. And if we have to rely on the Constitution, we know that's not going to work because you know people will vote against it, bills will get held up, stuff will get vetoed, it'll get filibustered, so we're just going to kind of build this thing on the edifice of the Constitution, but in, in, ex, with the explicit claim that we're doing it to get around the Constitution. So that's not just me saying that, being, you know, because I'm against it. The people who were for it initially would say, yeah, it's, it's not constitutional, but that's a good thing because the Constitution's a problem. So I guess also on the topic of immigration, I'm curious about what you think of the way that asylum seekers are treated in the US. So um, they'll come and they'll be put in an immigration detention center. They have no access to internet, so they don't have access to information that they can use for their court dates to defend themselves. Um, and there are a number of other issues, which I'm sure you know, I'm not going to get into. So would you, would you say that because they are in the US, they should be treated the same way as US citizens because they deserve to be treated the same way under U.S. law? No, look, every, everyone who sets foot in the United States is, um, what I meant by that, the jur under the jurisdiction clause, is you're entitled to the, pro to the protection of the criminal law, but you're also entitled to obey the criminal law. It doesn't mean you get the same, you know, you don't get the same treatment in a U.S. civil court as a citizen versus a non-citizen, or especially as, um, an, uh, you know, 
someone who came in, who entered the country unlawfully. Um, so no, I wouldn't say it as, as quite the way you said it. And I would also make a distinction. Look, I think the, the line between uh, some, a genuine asylum seeker and people simply seeking a better life has been greatly blurred in the past. Um, look, I did, the, I did the math on this just the other day. I didn't use this in something I wrote, but it's, I saved it, so maybe I will. If you look at the, um, the United States is in a very unique position in a lot of ways, both geographically and economically. Economically, if you look at the three major surveys that track per capita GDP, they are the World Bank, the INF, and the United Nations. Depending on which one you look at, the US is either number seven or number nine in the world. And all the ones with higher per capita incomes than the United States are teeny tiny, really small, like Monaco and Liechtenstein. Like there's no country even remotely our size that has this per capita GDP. Um, we're also almost, uh, uh, almost alone in a hemisphere as having this very high per capita, even Canada, which is you know, much closer to our per capita GDP than a lot of other countries, lags significantly behind ours. And we have a very long, difficult to defend southern border. There's no other country that faces exactly the same position the United States is. So it's obviously um, an economic magnet. It, it's economic power and opportunity attracts a lot of people. And it, you know, that has caused, I think, some immigration advocates to consistently try to blur the line between what they'll, you know, they'll just say everybody who comes you know, is an asylum seeker. They're fleeing something. Well. Not necessarily. I mean, there's one thing to really be an asylum seeker fleeing an actual civil war or something horrible like the FARC, this Colombian narco-terrorist group that took over a third of the com a country for a dozen years and was only recently defeated by the Colombian government. And there's a lot of other people, many more, I would say, than who are genuine asylum seekers, just want to come because they know um, this is a better economy, they can have a better life. And I think if the United States doesn't accurately and adequately distinguish between the two, we're doing... Um, we're doing our country and the existing citizenry of our country a disservice. Um, so you obviously believe that the Constitution exists to serve some natural end, right? <coughs> some natural right. <coughs> so you don't believe, and you believe that it, out, like it lays out the way to achieve that natural end, but you don't believe that there's any way through reinterpretation of the Constitution to achieve that natural end in a better way? No, well, reinterpretation, I, mm, I'd be very leery of that because you know, now, then I, now I start to sympathize with the positivists. That sounds to me like an appeal to some higher law which Hobbes would denounce as anarchy. You can fix the Constitution through an amendment process, right? Which, uh, I'm all for that. Um, and there are, I think there are a lot of ills that one can correct in the American system without even resorting to the Constitution. But leave that aside. Let's say you have to resort to the Constitution, right? You cannot solve the slavery question in the United States without amending the Constitution. There was no other way to do it. And it was done. I think it was done the right way. It, it unfortunately, for political reasons, took another almost a century for the promise of the post-Civil War amendments to begin to be realized. Um, but the constitutional provisions that were introduced in the post-Civil War era, specifically the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, rather than just reinterpreting the Constitution, I would argue it's much better to just correct the text and make it unambiguous what you're trying to do, that nobody can deny it. Or, uh, or, or get around it. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you mentioned the debates in the Congressional Globe about the <coughs> intention of the uh, yeah. framers of the Fourteenth Amendment. And in there, one of the supporters, Connors, who I guess himself the son of an Irish immigrant, says uh, that we are entirely ready to accept the provision proposed within the Constitutional Me Amendment that the children born here of Mongolian parents shall be declared by the Constitution of the United States to be entitled to the civil rights and equal protections before the law in such matters. So is that not a support? Uh, so I, I, if I recall, I read this fairly recently, within about a month. That is the senator, forgot his name, from California. So yeah. if you read this debate, it, it can be a little hair-raising to, uh, to our ears today. Uh, a senator from Pennsylvania gives a kind of in politic is the nicest way I can put it, speech where he says, well, we got all these, what about all these undesirable peoples in the country? Are we legalizing them? Are we making them all citizens? Are we making their children citizens? And he specifically mentions uh, unfavorably Chinese in California. And the senator from California then steps in and he says, well, okay, I can answer for that part. Um, and it's not a friendly answer in the sense that he, here's the ground on which he says, uh, on which he defends the, that position within California. He says, first of all, 
I mean, it, it's, it's, it's ugly language. I'll just be honest with you. I'm not going to quote it. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it's ugly language. He says, yeah, the Chinese in California, they're, they're kind of a problem, or they would be if there were a lot of them, but they're bad news and nobody wants to live around them. That said, there aren't that many of them. Um, there's hardly any women, because just men come over to work. So they don't have that many ch children, and they're not, it's not a growing population. They tend to want to go home at the end of their lives. And so, and, you know, as far as we're concerned, it's just not that big a deal. In other words, he's not making a statement of, if you read his whole speech, if you can get through it, he's not making any kind of statement of principle. He's just sort of saying, this isn't a problem worth you know, worrying about in the near term. Um, they have a similar conversation about uh, gypsy populations in certain eastern states. Um, but when, when, whenever they are you know, in a real back and forth on the debate, say, what does this really mean? The senators that are the driving forces well, two senators and one congressman, that are the driving forces um, behind the debate say, look, the subject to the jurisdiction means not owing allegiance to anyone else, to any foreign power. It means you, you have to be um, at least connected uh, to the, United, the people of the United States through a, at least one citizen parent. And they don't make this explicit, but as I've said, some uh, Yale Law scholars um, um, Shruck and Smith, I forgot Roger Shruck's Smith. name, Roger Smith and, and Peter Shruck, they make the case that they think the 14th Amendment ought, really ought to apply to legal, the children of legal permanent residents. And having read the book recently, I, I, you know, I wasn't 100% won over, but it was persuasive. I, I don't have a strong reputation to that. Wait a minute. Kind of segue from this whole, where we saw this debate, and I was questioning part of that, where you have these debates going on not just in Congress but in the state legislatures about how we'll interpret this this birthright citizen clause and then the judicial or me, the jurisdiction clause. Should when we look for original intent, assuming that we should look for original intent, should we look for it from the authors or from the the people and their representatives who are ratifying and understanding this as a I think, it's, I think it's really both. And I don't know that how you separate them, right? Because the authors state the intent, but the ratifying public, you know, remember a constitutional amendment has got to get out of the U.S. Congress and then go out to state legislatures. So it's never, it's never um, a referendum, a direct, you know, I'm going to the ballot and voting on proposition whatever like we do in California. I don't think you do that in Virginia. If you do, I, I apologize. It's a bad idea in California. And I hope it doesn't spread. But... Um, they go to the state legislatures, which is sort of as close to the people as you can get, and they had to have debates. It took years. It took, well, the 14th Amendment was actually fairly quick. It got out of Congress in 1866 and was ratified in 1868, but some amendments can take longer than that. And there is a public debate about, you know, are we going to do this or not? Are, is our state, are we going to urge our state legislators to vote for it? And I think it is proper to study that public debate, both to understand what the authors intended, but what the ratifying public thought they were voting for. You've got to kind of do both. Um, and that seems to me to be the, the best way to, um, to uh, look at original intent, not, not, not one or the other in isolation. Let's take one or two more questions. Thank you. Is it okay if I ask a multi-part question about your article towards a sexual crime? How many parts? <laughs> <laughs> it's about three. <laughs> okay. Fire um, So in the article you say, Islam is not a religion of peace, it's a militant faith that exalts conversion by the sword and inspires thousands of acts of terror. Yes. And something about sympathizing with terror. Yeah. Um, I would assume from that statement you've read the Quran. Yeah, in translation. In translation. And you've read the Bible. Read the Bible. And you've read the Torah. Sure. So, are you saying that Islam is a religion that uses militant words or has gone through militant actions and therefore is a militant faith? Both. Both. The, the book, so I think I know where you're going with this. You're going to point to some passages in the Bible which, I, um, which say, you know, the Bible's, look, Machiavelli, who's somebody that I studied at great, with great relish and still do, likes to quote all the violent passages in the Bible and use that to attack religion, right? What he leaves out is the part that um, uh, you know, the faith sort of moved on from that original interpretation of the text, by which I mean the following, and I'll, I'll explain this quickly as I can. So the Bible, the Hebrew Bible is essentially 
or the, the ancient Judea is essentially an ancient city, right? In the same sense that ancient Athens is an ancient city. The main difference is one's polytheistic and one is monotheistic. But at the core, the difference is there's no distinction between civil and religious law. The law is the law. The law is not, it, to the extent that it's written down by human beings, it's not made by human beings. In other words, it's not posited the way I said. Even the Constitution, which I, like, which I believe is intended to reflect nature, um, it still had to be written by human beings. It's posited by human beings to be our closest approximation to what we think the laws of nature required. Um, in the ancient city, not true, right? Um, Moses takes the Ten Commandments. He speaks to God. He takes the Ten Commandments. Um, and the, the laws of Crete or of Sparta are, you know, Zeus talks to Minos in the cave of Knossos, gives him the law. He then takes that law to the Cretans. It comes directly from God, right? This, now, the other thing that you have to understand about the ancient city is the ancient city is inherently particular. These are just our laws. We're not, you know, we might conquer another city for whatever purposes, to take their stuff, to take their land, because they pose a threat, but we're not going to try to annex them or convert them, right? That's true of the ancient, um, the ancient Israelites, and it's true of the ancient Athenians, the ancient Spartans, the ancient Romans. The ancient Romans actually took this to a higher level where they conquered lots of people, you might say everybody, almost everybody, and their view was, if we conquer you, you just, you just bring your God into our thing, right? You just, you, we'll, just, we'll, make, we'll make a seat at the table for him, so he's in the pantheon, we'll build a temple for him, right? So Christianity changes this. Christianity has to separate the civil and the religious law. Why? Um, because it has no power, because it is born in a, in a Roman time where Roman civil law commands the entire Mediterranean and half of Europe, right? Now, I mean, I'm, I'm stating this from Machiavelli's perspective, so if there's you know, people in there thinking that I'm being blasphemous because I'm giving a, a rationalistic account of Christianity, I apologize in advance, but just imagine that I'm like five foot one, I have slicked back hair, and I have a wicked little smile on my face, so I'm speaking for Nick, right? Um, so Christianity separates civil and religious law, it says, you know, this is what render unto Caesar means. Render unto Caesar, right? We don't have the power to set the law anymore, but Christianity also no longer posits a civil law. You know, it doesn't even say, this shall be the civil code that thou shalt adopt when you regain political power. It says sort of forever, think of the two things separately. Religious law is about your conscience only. The civil law will always be a matter of the state, whatever it is. It could be the Romans, it could be somebody else. It doesn't matter, right? And it, adds this, and it adds something brand new, and another new factor to the ancient city, which is universalism, right? The conversion of all, which is its goal. And as, in principle, its goal is to convert everybody, but through the word, through persuasion. Now, Nick would say, of course it sets its goal as persuasion, or as conversion through persuasion, because it's unarmed. It has no way of converting by the sword. So it resorts, it invents a concept that Nick refers to. Actually, I don't think Nick ever uses the term, but Strauss does. Spiritual warfare, it will persuade by the logos, by the word, okay? Judaism, in this understanding, also separates the religious and the civil law, even though it does not do so in its book, it does not change its book, but after the Roman conquest of Judea, and the Romans essentially establish a puppet government, most famous being King Herod, right, who's the king at the time of the birth of Christ, we all know this is from the Bible or maybe from one or two Hollywood movies. Um, it has to separate the civil and religious law too because the, uh, the Jews can no longer control their own foreign policy. They can't <coughs> coin money. They can't levy taxes. They can't do all the things that they used to do. They can do certain things within their, the Romans reserve to them certain domestic laws that they can kind of like run your own internal affairs, you know, your own state criminal justice system and stuff like that. And we won't bother you, but we, you know, you're part of our empire now and uh, if you want to keep your traditions and your laws, you have to give up this pretense that they are the supreme law of your city. And so Judaism sort of adapts itself to that without going back and you know, changing the book. It never does that. Um, so Islam, in a sense, restores the connection between the civil and religious law. Makes no distinction between civil and religious law. There are, there are Islamic scholars all over the world today who will say, yeah, the law is the law, right? Ultimately, the law traces to God. And the goal should be the reunification of the ummah under a caliphate in which there's no distinction between religious and civil law. And there have been a couple of attempts to realize that in our time. Um, haven't gotten terribly far. They established something 
for a brief period. I mean, this is essentially what the Iranian Revolution of 1979 was actually about. They called themselves the Islamic Republic. It was the restoration of civil and religious law. They're the overthrowing of a secular regime based on this understanding. It's what's behind the ISIS caliphate. It's what's behind Al-Qaeda's grand dreams. Um, you know, I think it's, we should all be grateful that these things have not been realized, at least not on, realized on the scale to which the proponents seek to realize it. But my point is, they didn't change the book either. But not only that, uh, the, the people who are reading the book literally, like there's no, to the best of my knowledge, the most ultra-Orthodox communities in Israel today. And I could be wrong about this. I've studied it a little. I don't think I am. But the most Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox, the most conservative communities in Israel today do not read the Bible and say, we want a restoration of the kingdom of Samuel or the regime of the judges that ruled ancient Israel with no distinction between civil and religious law. But that is a fairly prominent view among a lot of uh, people in the Islamic world today. I don't see the distinction. I want a restoration, right? And that's why that view is dangerous. People used to say, you used to hear right after 9-11, well, I don't know how old you guys were on 9-11, but probably like born, right? Um, one or two. You used to hear right after 9-11, Constant argument, Islam needs a reformation. Islam needs a reformation. This was, there was article after article after article saying this. And I never wrote this, but I was one of the ones who thought, that's interesting, because the actual reformation in the Christian sense was a radicalization of the original principle. Not, now, it maybe have turned into something else, but that's not what Luther initially intended. So if, 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 I, if there were a movement within Islam to say, let's, let's do essentially what the Christians did by design and the Jews did by necessity, which is to separate religious and civil law, to make religious law a matter of faith, a matter of private conscience, and civil law something else that governs the political sphere. Uh, I'm not aware of that movement. I, I just I don't know that that's a significant thing in the Muslim world. Um, I've certainly not read, I've read a lot of Westerners say that this is what they would like to see, but I haven't seen a lot of takers from within the faith itself. And the one thing I'm pretty convinced of is that people from outside the faith are not going to be able to convince people who are inside the faith that their outside interpretation is right and ought to be followed versus you know, these others inside interpretation is right. If you're inside, you, you think you know it better than people on the outside, and why would you take advice from people on the outside? I think I've got to wrap things up. It's almost 6.20, so I appreciate you guys hanging out, and uh, just um, one more round of applause for our speaker.